Stand to your feet with us. We're glad you're here to worship, and we want to start this morning in song. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou
it thou art. He's worthy of our praise. We're glad you're here with us this morning. If you're tuning in online as well, welcome. Uh, we, we hope you got a worship guide on your way in. It's going to tell you about things coming up, but sometimes there's more things coming up than we can fit on a worship guide. So a couple of them that might not be on that guide but would have been in your newsletter. So if you don't get our email newsletter every week and you want to, please let us know on your Connect card. We'd like to add you to that list so you're seeing all of the things because we can only talk about so many on a Sunday. But we do have a new small group starting on Wednesday nights. So if you are relatively new at Westview and you haven't found a small group to plug in, uh, this one might be one for you. It's called Stealing from God, right? I think that's the name of it. Can you put the picture up, Sherry? Yeah, so starting Wednesday, April 6th, that's a new option for you on Wednesday nights. It actually talks about how um, in our culture and in our world, atheism is growing in popularity, but really... They steal a lot of logic and science and reason. Lots of things that God has created, they have to grab hold of to make the stand that they try to make. So um, they don't realize that they sort of inadvertently confirm who God is. But it would be a neat thing to learn about. So that's one to consider if you're not plugged in somewhere. Another option, Tuesday mornings um, at 930 is a mom's life group that meets. And it's ongoing. It's not a new group, but we are starting a new book. So it's a great time to jump in with us. So if you have Tuesday mornings free... Um, come join us. We meet every other week for Bible study and every other week for playtime and mom time. Um, and another thing that I would love to invite you to is if you are somebody who's retired or semi-retired or has time on Tuesday mornings, maybe you're self-employed, we need child care for, those, for that mom's group. Um, and so if you remember what it was like when you had little ones at home and you got an hour and a half of adult conversation once a week, um, if you would like to help us on Tuesday mornings, if we had eight volunteers, it would be one Tuesday a month commitment. So those of you who are free on Tuesdays, keep that in mind. Write it on your Connect card. The last thing I want to mention is not in your worship guide, was in the newsletter, Evening with the Stars. Um, this is a special community-wide event. Many churches are coming together to pull this off, but it creates a prom-like night out on the town for teenagers and adults who have special needs um, or otherwise don't get to usually partake in events like this. And the, the options to volunteer are um, lots. I mean, set up, clean up, snack table, punch server, um, bathroom monitor, take their coats and greet them when they get there. Lots of things. So if this is something that might be on your heart or God's saying this, you would be great at this, let us know. You can be part of the Westview team that is contributing to this event at the end of April. All right, let's continue in our worship. We worship you. 
as we move into prayer time this morning. Yeah, join me in prayer. If you'd like prayer specifically for something, come on up here with the steps and someone will join you in prayer. Father, we turn our hearts to you. We thank you for the privilege of joining together today to worship you. We declare that you are here, as we sang. You are here. You are here. Even if we can't see it, you're working. We thank you that you're at work on our behalf. Lord, we, we have many needs here in our congregation, and we want to lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who have physical needs, those who have emotional illness, those who have financial needs. We lift them up to you and ask you to show yourself. Intervene in their circumstances. Make yourself known and get yourself glory, we ask. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, we thank you for the greatest miracle of all, that you would give us peace in our heart and hope in our heart. We Yield ourselves up to you that you might fill us with your peace and your hope. Lord, we thank you for your work on the cross, that you have swept away our every sin, that you have taken the punishment due us and interceded for us. We declare ourselves to be cleansed and made whole by your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for washing away our every sin. Even the old ones, the ones that are hard to forget, we yield them up to you today, Lord. And Lord, we want to pray for our missionaries. 
that you have put on their heart to leave the comfort of home and go far away. We pray for Rick and Christina, Michelle and Nicole, Shelly, George and Sherry and their family. We ask that you would be with them, that you would speak to them and guide them, that you would be their covering, that you would war on their behalf, that you would deliver them from the evil and the obstacles of the enemy. Give them an open path and open doors to declare your love for people far away. Last week, Lord, we pray for our our leaders, we pray for our leaders in the church, for our leaders here in Manhattan, in Kansas, and in our nation. We ask you, you would raise us up, leaders who would follow you and do your will. Lord, that you would guide each one of them, use them to bring about your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray for Pastor Brian, that you would lead him today and speak through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tracy. As I look forward to uh, my senior years, I know some of you look at my gray hair and say, aren't you already there? So I look forward to my senior years. I I think one thing I'm going to love doing is hanging out in city parks um, because I just enjoy watching people go by. But today, one of my favorite places to see people go by, it's kind of an unusual place, but it's actually in the airport waiting rooms. I've uh, been in local, you know, obviously our regional airports and things like that. I've also been, like, one of my favorite ones is, like, in Johannesburg, South Africa, where you see the whole southern hemisphere coursing through there. You just sit there and watch. It's like, look at all these people, all these tribes, all these, it's like, it's exciting, but I just love watching people. And I've kind of come to this conclusion that when you're sitting in an airport waiting room, I think there's largely, I can categorize people into two categories, two categories. Let me show you a picture here. Can we turn down that lights just a little? I think it's actually those ones right there. (laughs) Of all the ones. There we go. Thank you. So we look at this. I think there's two categories of people here. Do you see them? Take a look. So I'm hearing all this murmuring. Yeah, I think there's two categories of people here. I think there's those people that are confident. You look at them, they're relaxed, right? They're reading the paper. They're not anxious. You know why? Probably because most of them have their tickets in hand and know, know they're getting on that next flight. The other group are the people on standby. You can see them here, right? They're standing up. They're not sure. They're not sure that they're going to be on this next flight. So I think there's always just two categories. Those are anxious, like I'm not sure, and, and those who are sure. Last week, I started the sermon with the Great Commission, the most commonly recited by Scripture here in this church because we believe in it so much, where Jesus says, go out and make disciples. But the last, the last verse of the Great Commission, he says, and, and be sure of this, be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of age. And, and I believe we, we, we tackled this question last week. Are you sure Jesus is with you all the time? And I think people fall into two categories. There's those who are confident. I know he's there. And there's those who are on standby. I'm not sure. Where do you see yourself in the airport waiting room of life? Waiting for your destination flight. Are you confident that Jesus is with me? I mean, he's right here. Like, I can put a chair out. I know he's there. I talk with him all day long. I see him intermixed in my entire day. Or are you on standby? I'm not sure. And I'm not really sure until that final gate closes, that last minute 
but I'm surely hopeful. Well, I'd like to welcome you to our waiting room here. Relax, sit back. My prayer is that today's look into God's word, as we look at this together, that we'll be more confident, that we'll all walk out of here more confident that Jesus is here. He's here all the time. I'd like to welcome everybody. I, I see a, a number of new faces here, so welcome to Westview Community Church. My name is Brian. Uh, Lene uh, showed you this worship guide that we have on the back. There's this outline. Uh, if I go over this with you real quick, this is, a, this is what we're going to talk about today in God's Word. And here's an outline of what we're going to share and talk about. That's right there. But for our guests, too, this Connect card is really, really important for us. Like, if you would make sure you put your name and, and like a phone number or an email and drop it in these boxes or go out to our welcome center where we have a gift for you, but we would just love to connect with you. Even if you're just visiting today, we want to say thanks. Thanks for being here. If you're looking for a church home, we really want to talk with you. Say, how can we help you put where the Holy Spirit wants you? That's what we want too. So make sure you fill it out before you take off today. I'd like to welcome those who are online with us too. Uh, we always have a big online family, so we enjoy this. All this information is right there on our Facebook Live. And it's on our website too. You can connect with all that. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, chapter 3. The book of Daniel. I'm just going to take me a little bit to get there, but you can get caught up and get ready, and I'll catch up with you in just a minute. We are in this Easter sermon series called Another. Another. And the premise is there's always another there. There's always another there. And his name is Jesus. We use that word another because I think we need some reminding that he's there. I think we need that reminder Jesus is always there. Because can we be honest? Like some days I get so busy and I do the whole day without him. And I don't even remember that he was even there. Or sometimes maybe as we grow in our understanding of Jesus, maybe we just don't fully understand what his presence is all about. Like he is here all the time. So we started, and, and as we head towards Easter, there's two things we want to accomplish. We want to fully share in all these different ways that Jesus is with us always. Can't miss it. But we want us every week to be encouraged how we live, like we live like he is there. Week one, we just started this series a week ago. We said another in creation. We, we shared that Jesus has always been he has always existed. He's not created. He says, I am, just like the Father says, I am. And we've seen that, that as we went through the Bible and we looked at his presence all the way through the Bible, we kind of set the foundation last week. There was another in creation. God created everything through Jesus. And we went over all the scripture that showed that God created everything through him. We shared by the time we're done that Jesus is the first and he's the last. He's the beginning and he's the ending. We said he's supreme. And since God put Jesus first in everything, we ask this question and put out this challenge, is he first in your everything? And if you're here last week, I hope you walked away from that question every day is, is he first in my everything? Your pastor does this too. I don't write these for you. I write these for me. You just get to hear them. All week long, I was like, are you first? Are you first? I did great for about four days, fifth day. I did the day without him, and I felt horrible about it. <coughs> Take that challenge. Is he my first? Is he in everything? So let's explore another way that we can find and know Jesus is with us all the time. So here's our first sermon note together. An unusual place to find Jesus the Old Testament. An unusual place to find Jesus is the Old Testament. I think a lot of times we think of Jesus, we don't think of him until the New Testament, right? It's like, it's like, here he came to earth, Christmas Day, and the whole New Testament, the Gospels are all about his life, and the letters all point back to him, but we sometimes don't think he's in the Old Testament. And what's interesting there is that Jesus, last week we shaped that he's always been there, He's always been around, and God created everything through him. So if God created everything through Jesus, and he's always been around, then he would have been around the whole history of mankind, which puts him right in the Old Testament. 
And you see him in many places throughout the Old Testament. I'm not just talking the prophecies and things that talk about him coming. I'm talking about him there. And so I want to go and show you a couple of scriptures in the New Testament that show us he was in the Old Testament. There's a big word I want to use here. It's called a Christophany. Christophany is how we see the literal presence or the spiritual presence of Jesus throughout, especially in the Old Testament. This first scripture I want to show you is actually out of the Gospel of John chapter 8. Jesus is in this big discussion with a group of people. They're believers, and this conversation gets really snarky as Jesus begins to explain, I've always been around. I've always been there. Picking up in verse 56, Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. And the people said, well, hold on a second. You aren't even 50 years old. How can you say, Jesus, that you've seen Abraham? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. And this is amazing when we look at the scriptures that Jesus presents himself to, to the people there. He presents himself as the one who's above all time. The one who knew Abraham's joy and knew him. Jesus says, not only did I know him, he says, I was around a long time, a long time before even that. Let me give you another glance. This is the Apostle Paul, early church leader, writing to the church in Corinth, and he's reminded them of back in the Old Testament when they come through the desert with Moses in the Exodus. And he says this, chapter 10, starting in verse 1, he says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the desert, in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. And in the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with him, and that rock was Christ. He's referring to Jesus' presence, even in the Old Testament. That rock, you know, they're going through a desert, right? Not a lot of water. With Moses' staff, taps the rock, and God provides water for all the people. And he was saying, there you see the presence of Jesus. I'm setting this up so as we now we go to Daniel chapter 3, I think here's another Christophany that we want to see. The background here in Daniel 3, we talked about this a couple weeks ago when we talked about Ezekiel, is Israel is now collapsed as a nation. Israel really doesn't exist. They're all slaves in Babylon. In the story of Daniel, there are three characters they talk about. Many of us, if we had Bible and stories as kids, we love this story. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so these three, what happened is Daniel and these three, while they were taken as slaves into Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar realized there's something special about these four guys rose up in prominence and were given positions in royal service. So not only King, King Nebuchadnezzar approves them, he raises them up as slaves and gives them, they're still slaves, but they're put in really key positions. And one day, King Nebuchadnezzar, he builds a 90-foot statue of a false god, and he declares, every time you hear the instruments, I want everybody in the sound of that to stop, bow down, and worship this statue. Now, I just want to give you an idea. This ceiling is probably maybe 25, 30 foot tall. 90 foot tall. Every time you hear the music, stop and bow. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down. They refused to leave the true God for this false God. And how did King Nebuchadnezzar react when people in his royal service did this? Starting in verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual, and he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. 
And so these men wearing their robes and their trousers and their turbans and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. I would say for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this is not a good day at the office. Tied up, thrown in, closed and all into the furnace. Their crime, they refuse to bow down and worship a false god. We imagine this furnace, we're guessing probably, but, but in Babylon, uh, brick ma making, they were really known for their structures, and, and so we imagine this is a massive kiln. And if you can imagine a massive kiln in that time would have fired the bricks at 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you take that times seven, I don't know how you do that. But it's incineration. We, we see in the Babylon history, we see at times that, that they use that as a, as a form of execution. Let's go back to the story, verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, hey, hey, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, well, certainly, your majesty. So he said, well, look. He said, I see four men walking around in the fire. They're unbound, they're unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Unbound, unharmed. The king sees them walking around in the fire. But now there's a fourth. Here's your second sermon note. There was another in the fire. A Christophany. Whether it's an actual physical representation of Jesus or spiritual representation, what we know is there's a divine intervention, and whether it's divine intervention, Jesus is always in the divine, always with God, always by his side. Jesus was in a fire with him. Hey, would you throw that scripture back up there real quick for me? Thank you. What's interesting is when we go back and look at that last phrase there he says look I see four men walking around in the fire unbound unharmed and the fourth looks like a son of the gods what's really interesting when we look at this is Jesus didn't deliver them from the fire he didn't pick them up and take them out he delivered them in the fire he's in there walking around with them unharmed untouched unbound I think that's really important he didn't deliver them from the fire he delivered them in it that's important pay attention to that point let's take a breath for a second what fires did you encounter this week I want you to think about that. What fire did you go through this week? Or what fire are you in right now? Is it a small fire? Maybe you went through a small fire. Not a big deal. Maybe your life right now is that typical four alarm dumpster fire event. I want you to capture that fire, that moment, what you're going through, and I want you to think about that as we go through this list. Here's a list of lessons from the fires of life. Lessons from the fires of life. First, fires will come even when we're good. Fires will come even when we're good. I think we know this. I think we know the fires that we create. I know what my sin does, and I know when it flames up, it's like, I did that. 
But sometimes, <laughs> sometimes life sucks. That's a Latin word. <laughs> or it might be Greek. And it throws things at you because we live in a sin-broken world that had nothing to do with what you did that week. It's just our world is broken. And so sometimes the fires come. And they can happen even when we're good. They can happen even when we stand up for what is right, for what is holy, for what is good. The fires can really come against that because we have an enemy who loves to turn up the heat. So let's start there. Fires will come even when, they're, even when we're good. Second one, second lesson. When things get hot, don't bow down. When things get hot, don't bow down. What is the first thing? I mean, we normally as humans don't like fires, right? So what's our first thing we want to do when we're in a fire? Come on, shout it out. Stop, drop, and roll. That'd be a great, great sermon series. <laughs> we did that one not too long ago. That's was, that was great. I'm glad something stuck. That's awesome. Grab a fire extinguisher. Most of the time we look for a way out, right? We immediately are looking for a way out. And sometimes because we're so adverse to adversity that we make bad choices when we try to escape the fire. We can blame God. We can blame others. We can even change our allegiance. We can go and try and find our hope in something else. But don't bow down when you're in a fire. I know that I can be rescued from cancer, but if I'm not, I won't bow down. I know that my troubled marriage can be restored, but if not, I won't bow down. I know when I lose my job and I'm struggling and I'm financially insecure, and even though I'm struggling, I won't bow down. Don't pray for deliverance from the fire. Pray for deliverance in the fire. Because that's where God does his best work, through Christ. So not only do we have first those fires will come when we're good and when it gets hot don't bow down here's the third thing the lessons from the fires of life is don't lose the promise in the flames every time we get in a fire and the flames are all around us we tend to lose where we're at and we tend to lose the promise in the midst of the fire remember there's always a promise what is that promise? Let's go back to Daniel's story first. Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 26. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, then approached the opening of the blazing furnace, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out! Come here! And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the royal advisors, they all crowded around them. And they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched. And there was no smell of fire even on them. They come out of 1,600 degrees times seven. And they're not harmed, they're not singed, they're not scorched. But I'm not sure it tells us the promise. We see it, but what is the promise? Let me jump over to Isaiah 43. Words that permeate throughout the Bible, starting in verse one. Here's the promise. Listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, do not be afraid for I've ransomed you. I've called you by name, you are mine. When you go through deep waters, 
Here's a promise. I'll be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, here's a promise. You won't drown. And when you walk through the fire of oppression, here's a promise. You will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. There's the promise from our creator and you notice when you look at this this word that repeats we always like words that repeat when you go through the deep waters when you're in the river when you're in the fire you notice it didn't say if it didn't say if you're in a fire or if you're in the water it said when. And that promise is when you go through the difficulties of life, you will never be alone. And I promise you, I will fully restore you. And I think it's okay to push back here a little bit, saying, hold on a second, God, I've gone through some fires and you could smell my hair. It's got that singy, nasty smell, you know, when hair burns. I've almost drowned. And I think when we look at this, we re realize this is a grand context. Because after this, God restored Israel. Back to their glory. And, and I know in our lives, when we do get singed or do get burned or do uh, go underwater, I know that ultimately he will have me and he'll restore me completely I know if I go through a battle of something like cancer I, so many times when we're by the side of a bed of somebody battling cancer and they're in their last moments on earth and there's wondering why did God not heal me in my heart I know in a few moments he's going to completely he's always got us and if he chooses not to heal me here perfectly, he will heal me perfectly to be with him. He's always got me. He will restore me. That promise is there. And he does that through Christ. Let me back. <laughs> we're still on a list. I get excited. So lessons from the fires of life. That the fires will come when we're good. When things are hot, don't bow down. Don't lose the promise in the flames. And the last one, fiery moments are never wasted. Fiery moments are never wasted. Suffering is hard. Life does stink. Fires in life aren't fun. But trust, trust that there is another at work all the time. No matter what fire I'm going through, there's another at work in the midst of my fire in those hard times. There's another who's going to take what was meant for bad and hurt and wrong, and he works furiously to turn it to good. And his promise, I know he always will. Let me share with you Romans 8, starting in verse 28. There's two key scriptures in here that you've heard used separately. I think it's really important we pull them together. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And I jump ahead just a little bit, but can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? These two go together, so important. Does it mean he no longer loves us if, I, if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or even threatened with death? Does that mean he no longer loves us? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Verse 35. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? 
And I know that one's important because when I go through fires, I start to question Christ's love. But here's the thing I always learn on the other side is his love never stopped. It never stopped working. It's always been there. Can anything separate it? It answers, no. Nothing can separate us from Christ's love. All those things. And he says, despite all those things, all those fires and trials we go through, victory will still be ours in him. Nothing can stop Jesus' love for us, so don't go on standby hoping. Be confident. Stay confident. He's at work, and he does the best work in the fire, not outside of it. Now, so this is not a pat answer. Let me share how he works in the fire. Let's say this is a fire that I created. My sin, I did it, woof, I'm going up in flames. He's the one that stands next to me and says, there is repentance. And there's one who's paid the price for what you did. Now follow me, turn away from that and come with me. He's at work in the fire through repentance. He's also at work in the fire through reliance. How many times we get into a fire and we find the end of ourselves? I do. I no longer have the strength or the power to overcome this. He says, I do. I always have the power and the strength to overcome this. So he teaches me reliance in that fire. He shows me reliance. Another way that he's at work as he teaches me is if, if this is a, a fire out of the result of my sin is he uses something very loving called discipline. He uses discipline just like we use our kids. Hey, let me get you adjusted. Because when I adjust you, you become more like me, holy and perfect. And if you're like that, you won't go in the fires as often. So he teaches me how to be righteous in the fire. And the other thing that I know we, we tend to kind of struggle with this a little bit, but he also promises reward in the fire. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, For our present troubles are small, and they don't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Jesus says, endure, hang in there, don't bow down, stay with me. There's also reward for those who endure. And the last thing, the last thing where he works in the fire is, is reminder. Suffering reminds us that we have a Savior who suffered too. He knows. He took on the entire sin of the world on the cross. He knows suffering that we would never know. He says, I get it. But I did this for you so that your suffering would be short. One day there will be no more suffering. He's in the fire. And when we get that right, when we let him shape us in the fire, instead of just being rescued from it, do you know what our witness looks like to those who don't know Jesus? Do you know when we come through the fires and we stand tall and we don't bow down and we have joy and we work through it and we look back and say, man, I'm, I'm 10 times the person I was before because of what he did through me. Do you know what that looks like to people who don't know Jesus, who have no solution in the fire except run, get out? If you go to the end of chapter three, you see what the effect of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had on King Nebuchadnezzar. Because he shouts out, praise to the God of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. There is no other God who can rescue like this. As we wrap up here, let me share with you uh, from 1 Peter chapter 4 to encourage us. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through or you will go through. As if it's something strange that were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. For these trials make you 
partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Remember, Peter's writing this to the early church. It's going through incredible persecution. The context here of this. And he says, hey, don't think fires and trials are strange. But instead, be glad. Be glad. Because that fire you're going through, it joins you to Jesus. It's our last sermon note. Jesus is our partner in the fire. There is another in our fires, and we are joined to him when we trust him and follow him in the fire and let him do the work that he will do turning that fire to good. Jesus knows suffering. He joins us in our suffering. He teaches us repentance, reliance, restoration, righteousness, reward. He reminds us. He reminds us of this. I'm coming back. I'm coming back, and I'll make everything perfect because there will be no more deep waters. There will be no more drowning. There will be no more fires. When I come back and create the new heaven and new earth, all these things will be gone forever. I promise. I promise. And when we're in the middle of a fire, let yourself be joined to him. He's there. And when we join in him in that suffering, allow him to do the work, we will think of Matthew 28, 20, and it will sing to us. Be sure of this. I'm with you always. So those who are confident, be confident. Those who are on standby, sit back, relax. There's another with us. There's another in our fires. The best thing that we can do is after seeing God's word like that is to walk out of here with some new knowledge. The best thing we can do is walk out of here changed. It's the reason why we gather to celebrate, to encourage, but to walk out of here changed. He's changing us every day. When you offer to Jesus change, you're giving him an offering. Let's give him the best offering we got together in prayer. Would you do that with me? Let's bow our heads. Jesus, we pray to you. <laughs> we sang this just a little bit ago. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. Press me into new wine. Bring out me change that not only grows me, but it glorifies you. Jesus, the biggest offering we got today is that every one of us walk out of here and know you are near. You are so near. You even dwell in us. Our offering is, is when uh, the fires come this week that we're not going to pray for getting out of it. We're going to pray with partnering with you in it because that's where you do your best work in us and we will trust you. As a church, we will be confident we won't be on standby wondering we'll be confident because we're going to go out in this world this broken dark world and there's so many that don't know you and they will see you through us and the work you do in us so father rise up your church let us be bold in the fires jesus change us so we can change the world we lift up the best offering we can give today, whether it's our tithes, our offerings, whether it's change. Whatever it is, we give you our best because you gave us your best. 
And we lift this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. So there is still time to register for that event or to volunteer or to donate candy. Um, and if it does rain, we will move our stations inside. Uh, but the concept is similar to Bap or Bethlehem Revisited. Uh, groups will be assigned a time. They'll start with breakfast. And then as they journey to the stations through Holy Week, they hear from Bible characters about what happened. They get a little memento to take with them to help them remember what they learned about this story. And then there's fun at the end, including some Easter egg hunting. But we would love for you to help us share this with our community, that the city of Manhattan would come to this parking lot on Saturday the 16th and hear what we're really celebrating on an Easter weekend. So um, keep that in mind. Will you stand with us? We're going to close with a perfect song to wrap up Pastor Brian's message. Going back to the scripture he shared, which happens to be my life verse, but Isaiah 43, 1 through 3, for I've called you my name. The same God that knows the hairs on your head and the specks of grain of sand has called us by name, um, and we are his. It says, when you go through deep waters and great troubles, I will be with you. When you wade through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fires of oppression, or in today's story, when you're walking around <laughs> in the fires of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God. And it says your Savior, but we could also say, for I am the Lord your God, and I am there with you. Yes? So let's sing this morning. There's another in the fire. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Oh. 
holds nobody and now that power lives in me there is another in the fire oh there is another in the fire Nothing stands between us, nothing stands between us. I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar of the heavens and the space between where thin. I can see the light in the darkness as the raising walls cave in. Nothing stands between. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone.